happens. I want to preach. We're going to read here in just a moment again from John chapter 3, verse number 16. Hopefully, if you have never memorized this verse, you do have it quite memorized by now. Uh, I, I do want to preach on the thought this morning, to live or not to live. Uh, I know that sounds an awful lot like uh, to be or not to be. Uh, I'm not sure the philosophical ideas of, uh, of that and, of course, its popularity. Uh, but I do think the title will be fitting for the subject content uh, today, to live or not to live. Uh, whether you perish or whether you have everlasting life is contingent on whether or not you receive the gift of God's Son. Um, whether we trust ourselves into His care, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there's, there's the axe laid to the root. There's the crux of, of the whole matter. Uh, if you believe, you're saved. If you don't believe, well, you're not saved. Uh, the, the Bible says if, if you're not currently a believer, that the wrath of God abides on you. You're condemned, uh, not waiting to be condemned, but you're condemned already. So I, I hope we'll think about that as we work through the message this morning. Whether I'm alive unto God or whether I'm still dead in my own sins. Okay? John chapter 3 and verse number 16, Jesus says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What would you be willing to do this morning to escape the judgment of hell? What would you be willing to do? Now, we know this morning that there's nothing that we could ever do. Um, Brother Billy Mitchell said there's nothing you can say, do, or pray, right? Uh, so, so we understand that and want to very well clarify that, that there's nothing that you and I in ourselves could do to ever escape the judgment of God, the judgment of hell. But, but if, you, if you would allow us this morning, let's, let's just pretend just for a moment um, that, that there is something maybe that, that you and I could do. So if there is, how much money would you be willing to spend if, if there was a price fixed on salvation? How large of a check would you be willing to write to stay out of hell forever? I mean, if there was a number, would you be willing to pay? Willing to at least attempt to pay? Um, what kind of loan? <laughs> that, that, that would be probably where most of us come in at, right? What kind of loan would you be willing to take out and make monthly payments on every month, write a check, just to make sure that you don't die and go to hell? Or, or what kind of change in lifestyle would you be willing to make? I, I mean, if, if there was a, a, a standard, a bar of goodness that, that you might attain to, if, if there was, a, if there was a, a, a mark where you could, if you could just live up to that level and, and you wouldn't go to hell, well, what kind of changes in your lifestyle would you be willing to make? I mean, would you clean up your speech? Would you maybe stop drinking alcohol? Would you, uh, would you get out of any fornicating relationships th that you're in? Would you, would you just clean up your life? Would you attempt to find religion? Would you set your goal to becoming a more spiritual person? Uh, what would you be willing to do if there is something you could do to escape the eternal judgment of God? If any of those things were were capable of you, uh, of you performing them and you missing out on hell, would you be willing to do any of them? Uh, or if all of them were necessary, would you be willing to make a good attempt at paying enough money and changing enough things about your life in order to get to heaven? Now, this is a serious conversation. Um, I mean, if we, were, if we were serious about this, I mean, we're convinced that there's a heaven... We're convinced there's a hell, and, and in this imaginative world, there's a, there's a price and a standard of morality that you and I have to live by in order to escape hell and get into heaven. Would you and I be willing to pay such a price? And, and I think in a serious conversation, I think the majority, if not all of us, would say this morning, yes. I mean, if I was convinced there was a hell, what good would my money do me? If I was convinced of hell, what good would pleasure do me? If I was convinced of hell and that was the way to escape from that hell, then what good would my life do to me if I didn't give my whole, the, the totality of my existence 
to trying to escape eternal hell. Well, it's a, ironic, I guess, would be the best way of saying it, that, that so many folks who would say yes to that. Yes, preacher, if there was a price, I'd try to pay it. If there was a change of lifestyle that needed to be made, I would make it if those things would allow me to escape hell. The irony here is so many people that would say yes to that say no to simple belief. So many people would say, yeah, if there was a, if there was a certain number to write down on my check, I, I would try my best to accumulate enough money and pay that. Or if there's enough lifestyle changes that I can make in order to be good enough to miss out on hell and gain heaven, then I would do that. But those same people, when you tell those same individuals that you simply have to believe, that you simply have to entrust yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, so many folks simply say no. In fact, they go as far as to sneer at the foolishness of simple belief. And in their mind, I'm sure, they're thinking, what is there to brag about, about simple faith? It's not a spectacular enough work. It's not extraordinary enough. I mean, if, if all I have to do is simply believe, what am I going to brag about? And there it is. There's, there's absolutely nothing to brag about faith. There's no boasting of faith. Because you've actually done nothing. You've just simply reached out and received what God has so graciously provided. And I believe therein lies the entrapment or the snare that so many folks face on a regular basis. Uh, that, that, that is the simplicity of the message. That they see the preaching of the cross, Paul says, as foolishness. It doesn't make sense to them. They're looking to do some great and glorious work to, to contribute in some magnificent way and be able to, at the end of the day, say, boy, I did something to miss out on hell. Well, this reality this morning really finds its best illustration inside of the Word of God. Inside of our Old Testament, there is a man by the name of Naaman. You may be familiar with him. And Naaman was the captain of the Syrian army. And one day, Naaman, the captain of the Syrian army, contracted a disease called leprosy. And there's no way that he's getting rid of this thing. He is trying and doing everything. He's exhausting every resource to get rid of this awful disease called leprosy. Well, there's a Hebrew girl that lives inside of his home. She's a servant girl. She's a slave. She's actually the dedicated slave or servant girl to Naaman's wife. And one day, this Hebrew servant girl comes in to Mr. and Mrs. Naaman and says, you know, there's a prophet in Israel that could cure Mr. Naaman of his leprosy. And the prophet's name is Elisha. And so she begins telling him about this prophet Elisha and all the miraculous things that, that he's accomplished, how God speaks through him and works through him in a double portion of what he, or how he had worked through the prophet Elijah. And, uh, and so she's just divulging this information. Uh, Elijah the prophet can heal Naaman. Well, Naaman becomes convinced that at least he wants to try it out and see if it works. I mean, what does he have to lose, right? And so Naaman leaves and makes that long trip and comes to the prophet Elisha. And uh, in communicating to Elisha, Elisha gives to him the remedy. Elisha says to Naaman, Naaman, simply go down to the Jordan River and wash yourself seven times, meaning dip down seven times. And Elisha the prophet says, Naaman, upon you coming up out of the water the seventh time, the leprosy is going to fall off and you are going to be completely cured. Well, Naaman hears that message, and he actually refuses. He refuses the simplistic procedure and remedy offered by the prophet. He despised what was demanded for his remedy. In fact, the Bible tells us that he was infuriated at this prescription. In 2 Kings chapter 5, in verse number 11, the Bible says that Naaman turned and went away in a rage. He goes away completely infuriated and frustrated. Why? Why, why did Naaman leave from the prophet so upset and disgruntled about what he had said to him? Well, I, I think the answer is simply this. The remedy for Naaman's problem was too simplistic. It, it, it was too mundane. 
It wasn't extravagant enough. It wasn't flamboyant. It, it didn't have the colors and the, and, the, and the lightning and the thunder. It was, just, it was just go to the muddy Jordan River, the despised dirty waters of the Jordan, and go down seven times and get up and be cleansed. And so Naaman's infuriated. And he goes away, the Bible says, in a rage. Well, a couple of verses later, verse number 13, uh, one of Naaman's actual servants comes to him and tries to talk some sense into him. And he gives him some real good advice. Here's what the servant said to Naaman. He says, well, you know, Naaman, if the prophet Elisha had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. The, the servant says to Naaman, the captain of the Syrian army, you know if the prophet had told you to do some extravagant thing, if he would told you to do some spectacular, wonderful work, I mean, I mean, Naaman, if he had told you to write a large check, if he had told you to clean up your lifestyle, if he had told you to take a trip and climb this mountain and, and pick up this heavy wave and swim this long distance and dive down into the deepest parts of the ocean, you'd have given it your best shot. How much more then when he says to you, just go into the Jordan River, go down seven times, and come up and be clean. Pretty good advice. Now, the Bible tells us that Naaman receives the advice of his servant. He follows the instructions of the prophet. And when he comes up out of the water the seventh time, the leprosy falls off from him. He was cured, and his entire life was saved. Well, in much the same way, there are so many people who are attempting to do the spectacular to be saved. I mean, I mean, they want to do whatever it is that is the most flamboyant, seemingly. Uh, some set out to try to have their good works outweigh their bad works. And they're just hoping that on the day of judgment, after, after they die and everything's said and done, as they stand before the judge of the universe, that God's going to put all their good works on one side of the scale and all their bad works, and they're hoping that they have done good enough that their good works tip the scale and God lets them come into heaven. Uh, other folks are just simply always just trying to clean up their life. They're just constantly, what, what we would say, repenting. They just say sorry about everything. They, they think the way they get into heaven is every night before they go to bed, they try to think about everything bad that they've done throughout the day, and they simply say, God, I'm sorry for that. And some folks are trying to find religion. Some folks are trying to be spiritual. Some folks want to be baptized. Other folks want to join the church. A vast majority of individuals will put money into a, 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 a religious contribution box and say, man, I hope this earns me credit. With God. What are they doing? Well, they're looking for some spectacular way. They want to contribute. They want to do something. At the end of the day, they want to sit around at the coffee shop and say, I did this to be saved. But none of those things that they are doing will ever save them from their sins. Isn't it ironic that they would give all of that their best shot? But when Jesus says, believe, they walk away in a rage. I will not. Only by entrusting ourselves to Jesus Christ may we not perish, Jesus says, but have everlasting life. The answer then of believing, whether we believe this morning, determines whether I live or whether I don't live. And so the question this morning is which category are you in? And that's really why I'm here this morning. Is I want to ask you that. I want, I want to press you. I don't want to just ask you and just move on this morning. But I want to press upon your heart and your mind this morning for you to answer that question for yourself. Are you in the category of living? Are you alive unto God? Or are you still dead in your sins? Are you in the family of God? Have you believed in Jesus Christ? Have you entrusted your undying soul into His sovereign providential care? Or are you still trying to save yourself? Are you still trying to do some spectacular thing? Or are you trying to force your way, if you will, into the realms of glory? Well, the Pharisees tried to do that. That, that was their whole religious scheme. 
uh, the schematics of their religion, the Pharisees, was I'm going to be the best person I can be. And so as you read through the gospel narratives, boy, don't they shine? I mean, they make for pretense long prayers. They stand in the corners of the street. I mean, they pray eloquent prayers and they think that they will be heard for their much speaking. I mean, giving, oh yeah, they give alms gifts. They, they give contributions to the temple, contributions to the poor and poverty stricken, contributions to society. They pay every tax and tithe known to man. They, they, they pay tax on, 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 a, on a mint. I mean, everything. They, they just give. Man, they're spectacular in, in all of their works, in their, in their prayers. They're spectacular in their giving. I mean, what about their fasting? I mean, they fast twice a week. I mean, religious to the core. I mean, the, the flag trees, the, the leathern boxes on their, on, their, on their biceps, on their arms, are, are embroidered. I mean, they're, they're the biggest in the, in the county, right? I mean, their borders are extended on their garments. They, I mean, they are dazzling with religiosity. And yet every night, when they pillow their head, they have no peace with God. Because they have to get up the next morning and try all over again. What did Jesus say to a crowd like that? Well, in Matthew chapter 11, here's here's His invitation to a crowd like that. Come unto Me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. All of you who are trying to do some spectacular thing and you're never getting it and you'll never get it. Jesus says... Come to me, and I'll give you what you've been looking for. Free of charge. I'll give you rest. This morning, what I'd love for us to do in our final message of John 3.16 is take a look at the final words that Jesus offers us in this most popular of of all verses. He, He says that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The first thing that I see this morning then is the tragedy of unbelief. The tragedy of unbelief. What God does with His Son in this verse is to prevent the sinner from perishing. Okay? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son not because He didn't have anything else to do or not because He thought it would be a fun or cool thing to do. Not, not, not to accomplish anything else, save the fact that sinners are dying and going to hell. And so God gave His Son so that any of us and all of us who believe in Him, that we will not perish, but have everlasting life. What does that mean? Well, well first of all, that means that perishing is the default position of mankind. Perishing is the default position of mankind, meaning mankind, man in general, people in general, are are not just basically good with a few minor errors here and there that need to be corrected. Mankind is not generally okay. He's not basically good with a, with a need of a few minor adjustments. No, no, the Bible tells us and is indicative on the matter that man is completely void of all goodness. I mean, I mean, totally staunched, starved of all goodness. There is no goodness. We could, we could all accurately say with the Apostle Paul, there dwelleth in me no good thing. Zero. Not, not, not an ounce of goodness inside of any of us to, to the extent that the Bible would proclaim. We, we are so devoid or so void of righteousness that you and I, all of us, have earned the righteous judgment of God, which is hell. The sentence is pronounced. We are all perishing outside of Christ. Well, the word perish here in John 3 and verse number 16 is a polyme in the Greek. And the definition really is very important. Uh, the actual word for perish means to fully destroy or to lose. So, so if you believe in Christ... You're never going to be destroyed. You're you're never going to lose out. But you're going to have everlasting life. The idea or the concept here is if life was a game and morality was the rule, you and I lost. We we lost and we lose every time. Well, Well, what do you lose? 
Well, you lose you. You lose everything. You, you gain nothing. You win nothing. There, there's nothing positive about the word perishing. It is full destruction, entire destruction. There's not a part of you that's left uh, that, that, that gains anything. It is, it is the fullest extent of what it means to lose. You lose your life. You lose your soul. Uh, you lose, uh, we think about possessions. Well, what, what, what good are possessions? I mean, you're going to lose your very life in hell. The Word itself, if you, want to, if you want to look at it, hold your place here in John 3, 16 and turn back in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 9. Luke chapter number 9, the word perish from John 3, 16, apolyme is translated as the word lose. In Luke chapter number 9, you'll see it kind of playing out here in two verses, verse number 24, Jesus says, For whosoever will save his life shall perish. He'll lose it. Well, what does it mean to save your life? Well, it means you retain it. It means you hold on to it. It means that you think in the end you can do something finally good enough to save yourself. You don't need Jesus or, or you don't need just Jesus. It's Jesus plus something else to you maybe. And just, just in some way, you've got to contribute to this thing. What does that mean? Well, it means you're saving your life. It means you're holding on to it. You're trying to do something with it. You're going to make something out of this thing. You're saving your life. Well, here's what Jesus says if that's you. If you're, if you're trying to hold on to it, if you're saving your life right now, Jesus says eventually you're going to lose it. You're going you're to be fully, completely destroyed. You're going to perish. Well, he continues, but whosoever will lose his life. What does it mean there? Well, to give up on it. To destroy my efforts. To lose out on my own attempt. To just give up on the pursuit. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same will save it. There's the dichotomy of it, isn't it? That, that, that if I try to save myself, I lose myself. But if I lose myself, then I've saved myself. Verse 25, for what uh, is a man advantaged if he would gain the whole world and yet perish and lose, what, watch it, what he says, lose not your possessions, not your house, not your societal standing, not your prestigious positions, but you will lose yourself and be cast away. You lose everything. Keep trying it. Keep being a good person. Keep thinking church membership. Keep thinking financial contributions. Keep thinking whatever you want to think. But if you think something outside of trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, you lose. Period. End of statement. There's nothing else to be discussed. And what would it profit? What, what's the advantage of it? What's the advantage of becoming popular in society? What's the advantage of becoming successful in the business world? What's the advantage of you making it and looking like you've got it all? If one day you're going to die... And go to hell. Well, there's none. The, the context back in John 3.16 deals with eternal retribution. You perish. Eternally, you're damned. There's no hope at this point. If you die without trusting in Jesus Christ, you've lost the game. You've lost yourself. Eternal retribution. It's the word hell for us. Well, what is hell? Well, imagine a place in the center of the earth with three compartments this morning. Compartment number one is a place called the abyss. And in the abyss, you have a temporary holding cell for some of the fallen angels. Category or, or compartment, if you will, number two, is a compartment called TARDIS. And in Tardis, you have the permanent residence of the other fallen angels. And then there's a third compartment in the center of the earth, and it's a place called hell. And the Bible tells us about hell that is a place that is reserved for unbelieving humanity. If you never trust in Jesus Christ... Now, you have to be, you have to be very clear here on theological lines. You don't die and go to hell if you reject Jesus Christ. You do, but that's not the only reason. You simply die and go to hell if you've never got the cure, okay? You, you die and you will perish and you will go to hell if you've simply never trusted Jesus Christ. Because again, man's default position is to perish and go to hell. 
We stand in desperate need of the cure. And so if you never get the cure, then you're never going to be saved. So hell is reserved for unbelieving humanity. Well, what is it? Well, the hottest fire, the thickest darkness, the loneliest isolation, the absolute removal of all goodness, no pleasure, no satisfaction, no enjoyment, crying uncontrollably, wailing out at the top of your lungs, grinding your teeth in pain. And that's the first 10 seconds of forever for the person who perishes. If you do not trust yourself to Jesus Christ, then that's your fate. This is where you're heading. Destruction, losing, perishing forever with no hope of release ever. That's the tragedy of unbelief. The next thing I want to talk about this morning is the benefit then of believing. The benefit of believing, which is the exact opposite of perishing. By by believing in Jesus, which we looked at last Sunday, means entrusting myself to Him. I no longer perish, Jesus says. But whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish perish. I no longer perish. I no longer lose my life. Well, what happens to me? Well, Jesus says, I gain something. I gain everlasting life. In fact, the word that He uses is the word have. The word have, echo in the Greek, means to possess. To have in my possession. To gain. To obtain. It's mine. If I believe in Jesus, I don't perish. I don't lose. I'm not destroyed. But on the flip side of it, I gain something. Something is placed into my possession. It's mine. Well, what is it? Well, life, Jesus says. You you don't gain destruction because you believed in Jesus Christ. Well, what do I gain? Well, I gain life. Zoe, life is mine. I possess it. It's mine right now. Notice the present active voice. You have it right now. You're not waiting to get it. As a believer in Jesus Christ, I'm not pursuing everlasting life. I'm not hoping one day that everlasting life will be mine or that it be realized one day. No, sir. No, Jesus says for the believer, I now, present tense, possess eternal or everlasting life. It's mine. Now, what's the significance of all of this? Well, if you have your Bibles open there, I want you to, I want you to notice just, just something real neat here. In John 3 and verse number 16, in your English Bible, the last three words of John 3.16, are this, have everlasting life. In the original text, the order is actually a different arrangement. And so instead of have everlasting life, it's have life everlasting. Well, what does this exactly mean? Well, well, it points to to the reality that life is the object that is being received, or that has been received. I believe in Jesus Christ, And so life has been received. The word everlasting is simply a descriptive word that talks about the kind of life that I now possess. So God gave His Son on the cross. Jesus died. He paid my sin debt. He was buried. He rose again the third day. I have, in time, trusted myself to Jesus Christ, placed my faith in Him. Instantaneously, I have been given life that lasts forever. Or everlasting life. This is, again, this is tremendous. The the word everlasting, eonois, in the Greek means perpetual, uh, continuing forever, valid for all time. This is life that lasts forever. Life that literally knows no end. In in John chapter 11, Jesus puts this in, in great terms as He's standing there at the tomb of Lazarus. In John 11, verse 26, Jesus says these words, Whosoever liveth and believeth in Me shall never die. (laughs) You'll never perish. You'll never lose. The word never is the indicative mood. this This is emphatic. You'll never perish. You'll never lose your life if you have believed in Me. Why? Well, because you've been given and you now obtain. You now possess life. What kind of life? Well, life that lasts forever. Life everlasting. I will admit here that there is a very strong, in in that term everlasting, there is a very strong element of duration. But there's a stronger emphasis on the quality of life. 
that has now been obtained. Uh, Because you have believed in Jesus Christ, you now have, present tense, life everlasting. If we could say it just a little bit differently, you have better life. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Not in the Joe Osteen sense of that either. (laughs) But you have a better life because you've trusted Jesus Christ. Uh, that, that's, that's well put again by Jesus. John chapter 10 and verse number 10. Here, here's what Jesus says. To the one that comes to me. Jesus says, I've come to you. And what have I come for? Well, I've come that you might have life. Remember that? But not just life. Jesus says, no, so that you may have life more. What's that last word? Abundantly. <laughs> Lord, abundantly. Superior. Or better. <laughs> Jesus is saying, John chapter 10, verse number 10, the Father gave me and I came so that you could have life. <laughs> so, that you, so that the wrath of God no longer abides on you. So that you'll no longer be perishing. But if you'd believe me, you would, you would not lose, but you would possess now life. And not just life, Jesus says, but life abundantly. Uh, well, the better life. But it's not just the better life, but, but, he, but he puts that superlative on there, doesn't he? Life more abundantly. So this isn't just life, and it's not just better life, but it's more better life. You write that in the margin of your Bible, if you want to, the best life. There's no better life than this. Then to know that your sins are forgiven. Your name's written down in heaven. You're in the family of God. I couldn't go to hell if I wanted to this morning. That's how saved the believer really is. It's everlasting life. Better life. Not in the sense of wealth, health, and, and prosperity. Again, uh, back to what Jesus has already said. What, what would it profit a man? What advantage would it be to gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? So, so, so what good would it be for you to, to, to never get the flu? What good would it be for you to have all the money in the world? What good would it be for you to be the most successful person in the world and still die and go to hell? That's not the best life. The best life isn't the life that you live now. The best life is what you have living on the inside of you that will continue to live and cause you to live throughout all eternity. It's what you received when you first trusted in Jesus Christ. The word everlasting here uh, is also translated, the same exact word is translated as the word eternal throughout the entire New Testament. In fact, every time in your New Testament where you see the word eternal, It's the same word, aeonoios, the same word for everlasting in John 3.16, with the only exception of that is in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20. Every other time you see the word eternal, it's the same exact word for everlasting. So everlasting or eternal life, here's what we have to come to grips with. Everlasting or eternal life is not a thing. It's a person. Okay? Uh, Everlasting life... Is, is not a trinket. It's not something that you take and put in your pocket and you sit down and it falls out. It's not something you put on a shelf or, or you even put into a filing cabinet under lock and key. No, no eternal life isn't, isn't a thing. It's a person. Well, who is it? Well, it's Jesus Christ. It, both in John chapter number 11, verse 25, and John chapter 14, verse number 6, here's what Jesus says. I am the life. Singular. I'm the only life. I am the life. And since Jesus is eternal, guess what kind of life He is? Well, He's eternal life. Well, this is life, John says, to know you and your Son whom you've sent, the Lord Jesus Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear before Him in glory. He is our life. And we possess Him. He's Christ in you. The hope of glory. Um, Christ is our life. He is that life. Now take your Bibles one more time with me and we're going to stay here in the Gospel of John, John chapter number 6. Here's a great another illustration of this. John chapter 6 and verse 33, beginning in verse number 33. Jesus given the discourse on the bread of life. Brother Curtis dealt with this several weeks ago in Sunday school in his class. Jesus says, For the bread of God is He. Not it. It's not a thing. It's a person. The bread of God is He which cometh down from heaven and giveth what? Bread, which is not a thing, a person, gives what? It gives a thing, not a it. 
right? It's a person. The bread of God is He, Jesus, which came down from heaven. And guess what? This bread, who is Jesus, who is life, rather than a thing, not a trinket, guess what He gives unto the world? Well, He gives life to them. Verse number 34, here's what, the, here's what the crowd says. They said unto Him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Verse 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. What's Jesus saying? Jesus says, I've got what you need. Much more than that. I am what you need. And so the Father has determined to send me because you need me. You don't need what Jesus has. You don't just need what Jesus does. You need Christ. You need Christ. It's not, it's not just the works of Christ. Does it include the works of Christ? Yes, it includes the works of Christ. You don't just need the teachings of Christ. Do you, does it include the teachings of Christ? Sure, it includes the teachings of Christ. But you don't just need the teachings. You don't just need the works. You don't just need the narrative. You need the person of Jesus Christ. Christ, again, in you, the hope of glory. It's what we need. It's, it's, it's who He is for us. We have to have Him. When you believed in Jesus Christ, you exchanged your life for His life. Your life was lost. And the salvation that you received was the gaining of His life. You now possess, you have everlasting life. Uh, again, you had Jesus and Barabbas. Remember Barabbas? He was, uh, he was that notable sinner, the criminal of society. He had done so many bad things that he was on death row. And he was fixed to be crucified himself. Well, Pilate's going to give him a choice. You want me to release Barabbas or you want me to release Jesus? Jesus has done nothing wrong, doesn't deserve to die. Barabbas has done everything wrong and deserves to die. And yet Barabbas goes free in the place of Christ while Jesus is condemned in the place of Barabbas. That's what happens the moment that you believe. You obtain the life and the freedom of Jesus Christ. Even though you were guilty, now you're said to be innocent in your release. That's forgiveness of sins. You now have the life of Christ, eternal, everlasting life. Now here's the debated question that, that I don't intend that I'll put to rest this morning. It's been a, a, a debated question throughout the centuries of church history. But the Lord's question looming here is, could I ever lose this life? I've believed in Jesus Christ. God loves me. He sent His Son to die. I believed in Him. I have everlasting life, which is a person, not a thing. It's Christ and not an object. But could I ever lose? Well, I would just answer like this and we'll move on this morning. The only way you could ever hope to lose this life is to get rid of Christ. And since Jesus has told us in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 5, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee, you're going to have a hard time getting rid of a person who won't leave you alone. Amen. You have a real hard time. Now, now, now folks come up with all kinds of stuff and say, well, we know he won't leave, but what if we ask him to leave? Well, Jesus didn't say, I'll never leave you unless you ask me to leave. Let's just stick with the Bible. I made my mind up a long time ago. I'm just going to stick with the Bible. It's life eternal. I have him. He would have to leave me in order for me to be lost again. John chapter 5, verse number 24. See if, you, see if you follow this. This is great. Jesus says, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, present tense, and shall not come into condemnation, uh, future tense, but is passed from death unto life, past tense. Right? Let's work through it again. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, watch this present tense, he has everlasting life right now. And he shall not in the future come into condemnation, but is, past tense, already passed from death unto life. Jesus has your past, present, and future all taken care of. Well, how? Well, he died for you. He already suffered your hell for you. For God to now hold you accountable for the death that Christ died would be called double jeopardy in the court of law. And you can't have double jeopardy. God's already charged your sins to the account of Jesus Christ. They're paid in full. The law holds no record of any criminality on your part. You're free, released, considered to be innocent of all charges. It's the exchange of life. You're past, Jesus says, from death 
into life. <laughs> you were perishing, <laughs> but now you're living and you're living with everlasting life. This is John 3.16 in the most simplistic language of the entire Bible. This is why God gave His Son. So that if you'd believe, you'd be saved. But before we close this morning, let me point out just one more thing, and that would be the expectation of desire. The expectation of, of desire here in John chapter 3 and verse number 16. I, I want you to know that this statement that Jesus makes in, in this verse, or, or really if you want to look at the larger conversation that He's having, when, when Jesus is, is making these statements, if we can say it like that in the plural, He's not stating them in a way of take it and leave it, bud. Take it or leave it, bud. He's not like matter of fact just saying it, throwing it out there with an, with an attitude of do with this whatever you want to do with it because I'm washing my hands of you. No, no, no he's, not, he's not just walking away in, with, with some nonchalant kind of attitude. No, no, no that, that's absolutely against the context of John chapter 3. In fact, the exact opposite is true. Jesus is wanting Nicodemus to believe the gospel. He's wanting Nicodemus to believe in, in him. He, uh, again, he's not just Nicodemus, take it or leave it. Nicodemus, I ain't got time for this. I've told you what it is. Now I'm going to go. You do it the truth, whatever you want. No, no, no. No, Jesus wants him to believe. He has methodically in John chapter 3 worked through the entire gospel message with Nicodemus. You back up to verse number 6, Jesus is dealing with the topic of total depravity. That which is born of flesh is flesh. He's saying, Nicodemus, you're not good enough, nor will you ever be good enough, because your flesh can't be improved upon. Flesh can't improve upon flesh. You can't, you can't become a better person. What is born flesh is going to die flesh. It's total depravity. You've fallen so far down, you're so notorious and so bad of a sinner that there's nothing good enough you could ever do to get yourself back up. And I'll tell you what's interesting about this conversation is Jesus isn't saying that to Barabbas. He's saying that to Nicodemus, one of the most religious people in all the world of Judaism at that point in time. And Jesus says, you as an outstanding character of religiosity stand so condemned that there's nothing you could ever do good enough to get yourself out of that condemnation. Total depravity. Well, in verse number 7, He enlightens him to the concept of, of regeneration, of the new birth. Marvel not that I said unto you, what? You must be born again. Why? Because your flesh is flesh and always will be flesh and will never be anything but flesh. So the only hope you have is getting another kind of birth. A different birth. A, a radically different birth. A birth from above. You need to be born again, Nicodemus. You need a new birth, a heavenly birth. You need to be born of God. Born literally by God. Birthed into the family of God. You need God to give you power to become His Son. You're the son of Adam. You're the offspring of Adam. You do the works of Adam. You lie, you cheat, you steal, you take advantage, you curse, you swear, you fornicate. You do all those things because you're of your father of the devil. You're of Adam's lineage. You need to be born into the family of God. You need a new birth. It's the regeneration. You've got to become something radically different. And so Nicodemus is picking up on all of this. He's not as dumb as you might think through the cursory reading of John chapter 3. Nicodemus says, man, I get that, but how is that accomplished? I need that. I, I, really, I know my own sinfulness. I, I, know, I know that there's no peace in all the attempts that I've made. And so Jesus tells him what the remedy is. Verse number 14. Well, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus says, I'm going to go to the cross for you, man. <laughs> you want to know how you're born again? You want to know how this transaction... You want to know how you're, how you're birthed into the family of God? Well, I'm going to take care of all the paperwork. <laughs> I'm going to take care of the legal matters. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. And I'm going to take the handwriting of ordinances that was against you and I'm going to nail it to my cross when I get finished with it. Paid in full. I'm going to do it all for you, Nicodemus. Just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. I'm going to be lifted up. And if you'll look to me, if you'll trust me with yourself, you can be saved. Well, how do I trust you? Would be the question. Well, he takes care of that in verse 15 and verse number 16. Believe in me. Simply trust me. 
simple faith. Well, it's not spectacular. It's not intended to be. Because the emphasis isn't on you. The fact that you're saved doesn't bring glory to you. It brings glory to the God that saved you. And But by the way, talking about desire, uh, this is what John's Gospel is actually all about. When you come to John's Gospel, John's record of the Gospel narrative, not over, over 90% of the material in John's Gospel is brand new material when laid against Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Over 90% of it. In fact, John is the only Gospel writer that actually states his emphatic purpose for writing his book. In John chapter 20 and verse 31, John says this, I wrote all of these words down so that you'd believe. That's it. John labored and worked and compiled and, and, and every, every stroke of the pen, every letter, every word, every sentence, every paragraph, every, every, every thought of, of, of continuity being weaved together, chapter 1 through chapter 21, every, every, every dot, every, every, every crossing of the T, every dotting of the I, all of it was done, John says, for one with one singular intent in mind. John says, I want you that read this book to believe. Believe. That's the desire. I want you to believe the gospel. John wants you to believe. Jesus had this conversation with Nicodemus. Why? Because he wanted Nicodemus to believe. John records this story as well as other stories because he wants you to believe and be saved. And it's the same way all throughout the New Testament. Uh, you think about Acts chapter number 8. There's a story of a man by the name of Philip. And, uh, and, and he's preaching. Philip's preaching the gospel and he's seeing a great host of people come to trust Christ as Savior. Well, Philip's going to have to leave that meeting, and he's going to go away into the desert, as it were. And there's going to be this man who is referred to as an Ethiopian eunuch. And he's in a chariot, a horse-driven chariot, and he's riding along. Well, well, Philip wants to share the gospel with that individual. So what does Philip do? Well, Philip, Philip's not like the rest of us Baptists. He doesn't stand by and say, oh, man. I tried my best. Now the Bible says Philip joins himself to the chariot. That means he ran and caught up with the chariot. And he began sharing the gospel with this, with this individual who just happened to be in the providence of God. Reading from Isaiah chapter number 53. Who is this one who was wounded for my transgressions? Who is this one that was bruised for my iniquities? Who is this one that had the chastisement of my peace laid upon him? And Philip took the text of Isaiah 53 and preached unto him Jesus Christ. Why would Philip do all of that? Well, well, you see the reasoning when you get to verse number 37 of Acts chapter 8. Here's what Philip says to him. Philip says to the Ethiopian unit, if you'd believe with all your heart, you'd be saved. Philip left where he was at and chased down a chariot because he wanted one more person to believe in Jesus Christ. He laid the axe to the root. He wasn't preaching, preaching social justices. He, he wasn't preaching social equality. He went out there to preach Jesus and Him crucified, buried, risen, and coming again. Well, if you want to get down really to the really fine print of everything. It's really the reason why I'm here today. I, I'm preaching to you this morning again because I want you to believe in Jesus Christ. I, I have no other motive. I, I, I'm not here for anything else other than the fact that, that I want to make sure that you have believed in Jesus Christ and that you have the assurance of salvation in the depths of your soul. If you have believed, wonderful, praise God. If you haven't believed, please hear the echo of my heart. And, and know that, that it's not just me this morning. It's not just that I want you to be saved, but I want you to be saved because Christ wants you to be saved. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 20, Paul says we are, as preachers, ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, watch the word, uh, Paul says we are begging you in the place or in the stead of Christ, be reconciled to God. Here's what, here's what Paul said. Paul said, if Jesus was standing here behind this pulpit this morning preaching to you, here's what he would say. Please believe. 
I am praying for you to believe. I'm begging you. We, we beseech you as though God did beseech, beg you. We pray you in Christ's death. We're asking you on Christ's behalf as if Christ were here. Would you please finally believe? You've been here before. You, you've heard the conclusion. You've been through the invitation. You've heard the message before. Would you please finally believe the gospel and be saved? That's the expectation of desire. It's not to fill a space of time. It's not to just have some, some mental religious crutch to hang on. No, no if you don't believe, you're going to perish. You're going to perish, so please believe. You must believe. It's not just that we want you to believe. It's not just that Christ wants you to believe. It's not, it's not that Christ just wanted Nicodemus to believe. It's not just that John wants his readers to believe. It's not just that Philip wanted the Ethiopian to believe. It's not just that I want you to believe. It's the fact that if you do not believe, you're going to perish, and that means you're going to lose yourself in hell forever. So believe Jesus. Trust yourself to Him. Because He saves everyone that comes to Him. Isaiah chapter 55, verse number 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters and drink. Now let's, let's, let's draw down here to a conclusion. God, God has spoken. The record's true and it's settled. Righteousness is given to the one who simply believes. Not to the one who does some spectacular thing. Okay? Uh, unbelief may seem to you to be this strong and impressive thing. You may live in this illusion that you're taking your own eternity into your own hands. I'm not going to respond and I'm, going, I'm not going to believe today just like I didn't believe last week, last month, last year. I'm going to, I'm going to hold on to this thing. And that seems so strong and, and impressive in your mind. But please hear me. It's a fool's errand that you're about. No one ever heard tell of a person binding themselves and throwing themselves off into hell. Nobody does that. You don't have the, the illusion that you have your eternity in your own hands. Not, not even close. No, 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 you don't control your own fate in that sense. You're, you're, not, you're not dealing with it on your own terms. One day, you're going you're gonna to find out the truth of the matter. And it's going to be too late. And, and, and in that day, you're going to fight and kick and scream and lash out with all of your energy. And it's too late. You're going to be tied, hand and feet. And you're going to be thrown into hell where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And when you ask, can I get out? The answer is no. And when you ask, can I just have a drop of water to cool my tongue in this flame? You're going to be told no. There's no satisfaction. There's no pleasure. There's no enjoyment. There's no trace of goodness. There's fire. There's darkness. There's isolation. There's uncontrollable crying. There's wailing at the top of your lungs from the pain. There's grinding your teeth forever and forever and forever. And in that moment, as you're being tied and carried and thrown. How weak and unimpressive you're really going to look on the day of judgment. Because the thought of foolishness is the worst sin that a man could ever commit. And how foolish of a thought that you believed you could save yourself. And you couldn't. And no one ever will be able to. So believe in Him this morning. Give Him yourself and He will forgive you of your every sin. He'll give you His perfect righteousness and you will be accepted into the very family of God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Choose not to believe this morning and you'll remain condemned as you have always been. And who knows whether God will ever come by your way and deal with you again. You must believe. You must believe.
Let's stand this morning for prayer.